Welcome to the e-commerce momentum podcast, where we focus on the people, the products, and the process of e-commerce selling today. Here's your host, Stephen Peterson. E-commerce momentum podcast episode sixteen. Ryan Grant. This is going to be a great conversation that for anyone uh, under the age of thirty who's thinking about you know, what they want to do with the rest of their life. They need an experiment like Ryan. Ryan has figured out how he wants his life to be. In this segment, we're going to talk about how he has been preparing his whole life for this experiment, and um, including some chickens and sheep. A little surprising for you. And we also talk about how he graduated from college with an accounting degree, took the trek, went to the accounting firm, had a great job, um, great salary, uh, then realized, wait a second, they're only going to give me 15 days a year, and I'm going to have to do this for 40 years. Oh, and by the way, they want me to travel everywhere where they want me to go. I'm not so certain that's the life I want, and he chose a different direction. So we'll spend some time on that in this segment. Let's get into the podcast. All right, welcome back to E-Commerce Momentum Podcast. And tonight, our guest, you know, I'm going to try and describe him, see if you can figure out who it is. He's An absolute true entrepreneur. So it's a man, so you can figure that much out. But he's an accomplished speaker. And I've just noticed that he's been speaking at multiple places over the last uh, couple of years. He's an accomplished author. He's got a terrific book with a lot of great information. And he will do well over seven figures this year. Oh, let let me give you one more clue. He's only 26 years old. Now I feel old. Hey, welcome, Ryan Grant. Welcome, Ryan. Hey, thanks for having me. Man, I, I'm just blown away, you know, and, and it's not your age because you're so mature. I mean, it just you, – you have to hear that from a lot of people when they find out your age. they got to be like, wait, you're only 26. It's not like you look old, but it's just you come across so much – so mature, but just so much uh, experienced, I guess is the right word. But you've been doing this for quite a long time. You've already been selling for seven years online. Yeah, I've been selling online since uh, my, about my freshman year of college. Started with textbooks and been expanding into various other product lines ever since. And yeah, it's been been a, a decent amount of experience so far. And and I remember, uh, I guess it was last year we were hanging out and we were chatting. And I remember the story about that you have a duplex that you live in, right? So again, that whole mindset of you know. Uh, making money in different places. Where did, where did that start? I mean, it had to start before you were 18, but where where is that? Are your parents that way, or did you just have a mentor? It's a good question. My parents aren't exactly that way. Um, I guess it probably started, I was involved in 4-H growing up, um, so I had animals and raised them for livestock. Um, so I kind of saw the market rates there and how you could make money with uh with actual livestock and that sort of sparked a business mindset. Um, I had my own little flock of sheep, got up to like 20 um, when I was about 16. And that was sort of my own little business, had chickens, sold eggs, that kind of deal. Um, So that's probably what really got me on the path um, to the entrepreneurial thing. And then what really propelled me further into it was after college. And once I had the full-time job, I found out that I really didn't like that. And that, um, made me want to get a lot of these projects going on the side so that I could get out of that as quickly as I possibly could. Now, your degree is in accounting and, and business management. So did you work at an accounting firm or yeah, regular I worked, business? I worked at McGladry, which is an accounting firm. Um, it's one of the it's the fifth largest firm in the U.S., and I worked in their Minneapolis office. Okay. So you be, you're on the path to become a, a, a CPA and, and then a partner and that whole jazz, right? Director, partner, all that, that whole track. And, you know, and your parents, you know, probably helped you get through school and they're proud of their son, the accountant. How'd that discussion go when you decided um, that this might not be the path I want to take? Yeah, luckily they were, they were pretty supportive. They, I, I'd kind of been alluding to it for probably about nine months before I actually did end up quitting my job. So they knew that the accounting path wasn't exactly what I was looking to do. And that I was talking about doing some sort of entrepreneurial project full time and kind of taking a, a leap of faith and quitting my job to to do that. So I on, when I was actually um, to the point where I wanted to do that, they had been they had been prepped pretty well and they were supportive. And that definitely helped quite a bit. 
Well, they must be blown away with where you're at today. You know, and it, it's just so neat to me um, to see somebody taking a different path because, you know, I'm an accountant by trade too. And, you know, I went to school a long, long time ago. And, you know, that was it. You took a job and you stayed in it and nobody would ever deviate. And to see somebody your age in this generation saying, you know, I don't think I want to do that for the next 40 years because it really is. It's 30 to 40 years of the same thing. And you're saying, no, nah, I think uh, I want to do something different. And, you know, the thing that I, I notice on your blog, Online Selling Experiment, which we'll talk about, is you really talk about you're not really chasing the money, you're chasing the freedom. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about what that freedom is for you. Yeah, definitely. So the, the money definitely doesn't hurt and you kind of need it for the for the freedom aspect. But the biggest thing that I want is just freedom of time and location. With the full-time job, I was tied down to whatever location they wanted me to be in. That required some travel. I was limited to 15 days of vacation per year. And ultimately, I felt like they were in control of me. So for, for ultimately, the freedom for me means that I get to choose where and when I work and how much. So I want things in place to the point where I don't have to work on certain days. If I don't want to, I can take off a week or a month at a time and things keep keep going. Um, ultimately, it just means that I have the freedom of choice to do what I want, when I want, and have things set up uh, to allow for that. How different is that today from your friends? And I'm because I'm I, I have a son who's older than you, mm -hmm. and he's pretty well educated. He works for a big business. He sells on eBay, okay. and uh, just a little bit on the side. But he you know he he works his uh, nine to five. How different are you than your friends um, generally? I mean, are any of them going a similar path? The one that's working with me now is on a very he's on a similar path, but with that exception. Uh, I'm quite a bit different from the vast majority of my friends from college and high school. Not, no one else that I know really currently is, is doing the same type of deal. They all have what I would call normal jobs for the most part. And, you know, what what happens, I mean, I don't know if how Minneapolis is, but, you know, I see, you know, companies coming and going left and right and, and people coming and going left and right and just lopping off a whole division or, you know, selling or what have you. Right. What happens to those who really don't have a B plan? Yeah, they, they end up in a, in a troubled situation or at least a poor financial situation often is they don't, they just have to go look for another job and depending on their financial situation, they kind of have to take whatever they can get at the time. And that might not be an ideal from a pay standpoint, from a life standpoint, or even from a career standpoint. So if, you, if they don't have a complete plan B or haven't been financially savvy prior to losing their job, it can really put people in a tough situation. Yeah, Brian uh, Vino uh, Beaver, he, he was telling me uh, the other day that um, his friend sells used cars and that most people have trouble raising $3,000 that they need for the down payment for the car. And so, you know, they're one paycheck away from trouble. And so right. I just think that this is such a smart thing on your part. And like you say, it's really pretty special for somebody your age. And I'm I'm proud of my son. He's similar thinking and um and and just has a B plan, just in case. And I just think that's so smart. Well done. Thank you. So you you uh you you really have grown your business enormously since last you and I were together. I mean it's 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 quadrupled. Um, and I want to talk about how you do it. And I want to talk about some of the other things you're working on. You have online selling experiment. You also have um, a group that you're involved in that does some sourcing. You also have um, you know, Facebook. Uh, and you post all your results. I mean, it's just amazing to me. You know, I, I love to find out how you have that much time. So I'm going to take us into break. And when we come back, I want to start talking first off about online selling experiment and what that is and what you're trying to do with it. And I want to talk about your book, and I do want to talk about your uh, selling group because um, I had Darla on and I, I just really impressed um, on how that's going. So let's go to break. And when we come back, we'll, we'll get to those. Sounds good. Today's podcast is brought to you by Seller Essentials, essential business solution for online sellers. Whether you sell general merchandise on Amazon or eBay, private label your own product, or if your focus is selling books, wholesale products, or liquidation lots, let Seller Essentials be your online resource for all things e-commerce. Essential resources, essential solutions, Seller Essentials, the Internet's premier venue for online professional. Visit SellerEssentials.com for more information. That's SellerEssentials.com.
So in this segment, we spent uh, some time talking about a lot of Ryan's uh, endeavors, and he's got a lot of them. We spend time talking about his online selling experiment blog, where he blogs about his business. But he doesn't just blog about the details. We're talking real details, real expenses, real expense categories, and what he spends. And I think it's a great tool to benchmark yourself against. And it really will give you um, an idea of what it could take um, to get to that six-figure a month selling level and what the related expenses are. And I think that's great advice. The other thing he talks about, which nobody else is talking about, is cash flow. And he actually shows you how he calculates his cash flow every single month. We also have uh, a conversation about how he was suspended from Amazon. The good news is he's back. The even better news is it lasted one day, but it was a wake-up call for him. And he spent some time talking about it and how he's changed some of his thinking about that, adding that risk. And at his age, to figure that out again, I think is crucial. And I think you can copy that same um, model. Um, we also talk about his book, his sourcing service, his coaching, and then his Facebook group where he's got over 2,000 members following him and his experiment. So let's get back into the podcast. All right, we're back and we're talking with Ryan Grant. Um, and, you know, just again, you know, this is a, a perfect example of how you want your kids to do. You know, they just figured it out so early. I think about at your age to be, to understand this, you're having such a jump in life. Um, I still want to know, though, who where, who taught you this piece of it? I mean, I understand that you had some animals and you had some taste of it, but there must have been somebody that said, hey, have you ever thought about doing anything, uh, something on your own? Anybody? I don't know if there's a specific uh, person that I can point to. I kind of just, I don't know. It's, it was probably a combination of a lot of factors, but I don't have one specific person or one specific path that's, I can point to that says this is who has influenced me most to get to where I am or to do hmm. to do this versus something else. Let me tell you, though, you're influencing a lot of other people. You know, you and I chatted a little bit earlier on your Facebook group. You have over 2000 members following you. And I listen to Scavenger Life and I know you do, too. And and they he just raves about how open and honest you are about this Amazon thing because he's not into it. And he right. just talks about how open and, and uh, you are with your results. So let's talk about Online Selling Experiment. OnlineSellingExperiment.com um, is your blog, mm -hmm. and it's kind of a life story. So tell us about that. Yeah, so what I do there is I share – the biggest piece is monthly I share my financial results from the prior month, and that includes essentially every detail – of my business, I, I include every expense that I incur, wages, um, o overhead, rent, um, cost of goods sold, literally every expense that I incur related to my business. I break that out on my blog to give people the full picture of what it's like to sell on Amazon. And then it allows people, the history is there from the beginning, of, I believe the first one's October of 2013, so people can follow along and see the progress. Regardless of when they start reading, they can go back and see how things have grown over time, um, some ups and downs, and ultimately get a clear picture of what it's like to sell on Amazon. And as we touched on before, one of, the, one of my biggest motivating factors for doing it and being willing to share the financial results is to, be, to kind of show an example of a younger person following a not-so-ordinary path and give, give people an example to see um, how that potentially plays out and give them an option besides just the normal go to high school, get go to college, uh, get a full-time job, and then work until retirement. So that's one of the large, it's a really big motivating factor for me for uh, doing the blog as well as sharing the results. Well, you, your accounting background right now, I mean, it just blows me away. I mean, you, you're getting into levels of details of expense, you know, not only cost of goods, right, but you're down to showing your storage fees, your removal order fees, your subscriptions, rent, supplies, things that people who get in this business don't understand that that is going to happen. I mean, this stuff happens, right? right? And when you get in and you think, oh, I bought this for $10, that's it. I am I just made 10 I'm going to sell it for 20 Wow. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, there's a little bit of about eight lines that are going to fall in there that's going to make that a lot less. But the other step that you take that I've not seen anybody take is you're showing cash flow. 
Right. And I don't think people get that far. I mean, I see a lot of people don't know their numbers. And uh, that was one of the things that Darla spent a lot of time talking about. Her tip was, you know, really know your numbers. But I don't think I've seen anybody else really talk about cash flow. Tell us how you're managing your cash flow and what you're using this information. How does that help you? Yeah, so for cash flow, essentially I'm just tracking every dollar that I spend on a monthly basis as well as every dollar that comes in. And then the difference is my net cash flow for the month. So basically what I'm looking at there is determining how much cash I have available to spend on inventory or business expenses at any given point in time. For the most part, I run a fairly aggressive cash flow strategy where I want virtually all of my cash deployed in inventory um, at any given time. So that's why you'll see uh, if you look through the cash flow uh, statements on the monthly results post, you'll see that oftentimes it's negative um, and sometimes slightly positive. But over time, it's definitely positive. But basically, I want to build this up as as quickly as I can. And I'm just about to the point of stabilizing out a little bit. But so I, I look at the cash flow to determine how much I have available, and then I find a way to get that into inventory so that I can ultimately create more cash with the cash that I have existing. And by tracking my cash flow, I know pretty precisely how much I have at any given time to allocate to inventory. And and I think, you know, again, you know, you're really taking the approach of this is a real business. This isn't some, you know, working out of your uh, off your kitchen table and that you've really taken this to a real business that, you know, I mean, uh, that finan- banks would appreciate this level of financial statements. Right. So mm, absolutely. You, you just had a little blip um, in your life. Right. You're cranking along and, and sales are really great. Everything's going great. And then uh, you got a little notice in your emails. Let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. So about a month ago, month and a half now, I got a notice from Amazon uh, that my selling privileges have been suspended. Um, so this was, I get the email right before I'm about to go to bed. The, I have the Amazon seller app on my phone. So it it notifies me. It's about 12, it was like 12.51 or 12.52 a.m. Um, and it says your Amazon seller account has been suspended. Um, so that was uh, not a very fun thing to, to uh, get right at that time. Um, but I, uh, so I, I looked into it and they sent me a suspension notice that had four ASINs listed and they were all items that were either returned as not as described or the customer had specifically said something in their feedback to the effect that the item was not as described. It didn't match the listing page or it didn't, uh, essentially there was an inaccuracy either in the condition of the product or on the product detail page. So I got that notice, um, did some research there, and went to bed a couple hours later, tried to sleep for a bit. Um, Mm -hmm. Then the next day, um, I put together an appeal um, to address the uh, issue with Amazon. Um, Essentially, what they're not the most clear with the suspension notices, um, but what from what I everything I could gather, the key issue was the fact that items weren't matching product pages or weren't as described. So that was the key issue that I was addressing in my appeal. And from all of the research that I did, the key things were to take responsibility for the problem, acknowledge harm to the Amazon customer, um, say that you're not going to do it again. Um, But then probably the most important part is to put an action plan in place to ensure that that sort of thing doesn't happen in the future. So how you're going to make sure that the, in my case, customers don't get items that they aren't expecting um, or so that they they get exactly what they are expecting. Um, So I put together that appeal throughout the course of the day. Um, One of the guys that works with me, he was working on it with me. I got it reviewed by um, a a small mastermind group that I'm a part of and submitted that around five o'clock the next day. Um, So this was about 16 hours after I was suspended. And then I was uh, submitted that started waiting. Uh, luckily, didn't have to wait too long. I woke up the next day and I had a had an email that I, my selling privileges were reinstated and already had some sales for that day. So <laughs> I was very fortunate that it was a short suspension, but it was a very scary uh, situation and a very, a very uh, direct reminder that it can all disappear pretty quickly when you're on someone else's platform. 
Well, let's unpack that a little bit further, right? Yeah. So one one thing that for people to understand is that Ryan addresses this on his blog. So if you go to onlinesellingexperiment.com, you're going to be able to see exactly what he did. And and this is where that maturity is going to show. You didn't overreact. You didn't send a, a screaming note at one in the morning or whatever. You you slept the rest of it, whatever you could sleep. You took the real solid approach to it. You you spent the day pretty much working on this. You asked for help. You asked for others to review it. You did all these things to make sure that you were prepared. And that's why it turned around so quickly. I've seen some others, and they don't quite necessarily take that approach. And that's a mistake. So here's a great lesson for you. Ryan spells it out exactly what he did, including screenshots of all the letters and all the notes for you. And that's how you manage around that. But the other thing I think is that this is giving you a chance to pull back a little bit on your business and say, hmm, what could I do differently? Correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, so, it's a big reflection point. So, so let's talk about what what that reflection did for you, or is uh, uh, what what you have done with it. Let's let's say it that way, right? So, I saw a note in there about a credit line, and you and I talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, you decided, hey, there's you took risk into the consideration. I always think about Dave Ramsey when he talks about, you know, hey, you could do this, you could do this. Ninety nine percent of the people do not ever factor risk in their formula. Everything's great. This is if, as long as everything works and, and everybody assumes that every, nobody goes into business thinking they're going to fail, right? Everything works. This is going to happen. But then that risk really does need to be calculated, and you're doing that now. So talk about that for a second. Yeah. So ultimately, the day – so ironically, the day I was suspended, I also closed on a line of credit with a local bank on that day. Um, so I hadn't drawn into it yet, um, but my, my plan was prior to the suspension – to draw on that line of credit, particularly in the upcoming fourth quarter, to purchase more inventory and ultimately try to ramp up sales. Um, and I would be going negative um, in cash to do that. So I would be drawing on the line of credit. The bank account would essentially be depleted. So ultimately, with the suspension, I kind of decided that that wasn't worth it. Um, even though and the other piece with the suspension is that I didn't mention specifically is that my metrics and the account health all had green check, check marks. There weren't any there weren't any warning signs coming that I was about to be suspended. It was just some algorithm or some Amazon web crawler that found too many of a specific thing that they didn't like. So there were no real signs that a suspension was coming. So ultimately, what I what I've decided to do is that I won't be drawing on this line of credit and that I will only um, purchasing inventory and growing the business with what I can back in cash. Um, and that's um, potentially a little bit of a lower risk um, play. But at the point my business is at currently, it makes plenty of money. So I don't really need to grow it any quicker. So ultimately, I've decided um, that I'm not going to draw on that line of credit. And then if I was ever to be suspended again, or if there's ever an issue like that in the future where something goes wrong with my business, I'm not going to have to scramble to liquidate inventory um, to pay somebody off. I'll just be able to go at my own pace, and I would own everything free and clear, essentially. I think it's just such a smart move. And you scale to the level where you're comfortable at this point, and mm -hmm. you're able to you know, cash flow it. Um, right from your own business, I think that's a smart move at this point because you never know. I mean, you, as you know, you, you had a little bit of a scare, and and that stuff is probably going to happen more often. The more products you sell, the the uh, the more you diversify, and as you expand in other categories, I think it's really smart. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. And if I was if if this was twelve months ago and my business was at a smaller level, I would still consider drawing on credit cards or potentially some form of a loan. Um, but now the numbers are a little bit too big to the point where I would be risking significant amounts. I'm not talking about five or 10,000 anymore. It's, it'd be tens of thousands of dollars that I would be putting at stake, and that's a little bit harder to immediately come up with if you get in a pinch. Yeah, I think it's smart. I, I, I really do. And I think, uh, I think it's so well thought out. I just love your approach. And I really appreciate the fact that you you know, you, you spell it out. I mean, you're, you're bearing your soul, you're putting it out there, and you're giving exactly – how you handled it, and, and the success you had. So let's now transition into your book. Um, mm -hmm. Outsourcing Sourcing is the name of the book. And uh, I'm going to read a little bit of it. It says, looking for a complete system to have people you trust source and ship inventory to expand your Amazon business 
um, looking for a way to begin outsourcing pieces of your business, outsourcing, sourcing is just for you. And so talk about, um, A, how you came up with the book, I mean, because I know this is your strategy and I know you've used mm-hmm. it because you and I have had this conversation, but I, I want you to talk about it and then talk about, um, have you had anybody use it and have some success with it? Sure. So the book is essentially, we touched on it briefly before, I'm looking to build truly a business and not just something that where I'm self-employed and required to run the whole thing. So it kind of, so from the beginning, I've been getting people involved with my business. And one of the first things that I had people do was help me source products. And the way I started was with having friends and family buy products. I would give them my sourcing guidelines and teach them my methods. And then I would pay them um, under some different compensation structures as items would sell. Um, so I was having good success with that. I made about $33,000 with the strategy in 2014. Um, currently I'm making, I've made a lot more than that so far in 2015 in the past two months, virtually all of my retail arbitrage is done by other people, um, other than me. So I'm spending north of $50,000 a month on inventory and a small percentage of that is actually spent by me. So the, um, the strategies I outline in the book are exactly what I'm using in, in my business every day. And they've been working very well. They've been generating profits. Um, definitely had quite a few emails come in with people using the strategies and they've been able to implement them themselves. Um, I've also helped several members of my mastermind group get their sourcing, um, get people up and running. And some of them have everything from a full-time sourcer who is sourcing $5,000 a week. And then that person turns around and ships all the inventory directly to Amazon for them. So they legitimately are hands off in the entire process. Um, So that's probably one of the biggest success stories so far from that. Um, But there's definitely been quite a few emails where people are, are seeing some good success and they've been able to set up systems similar to what I've been doing and really expand their business. Yeah, I was talking to somebody the other day and they were talking about a similar strategy and it's like they want to get them trained now because the fourth quarter is coming and they need to be well prepared and now is the time to do this. And so you're saying that this book can get you started and get you, it sounds like, to the level you want. If you can find somebody that you can take and trust all the way through, you can take and have them completely make it truly hands-off for you. That's really impressive. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Very cool. Very cool. So, you know, the next thing that I, you know, I mean, I, man, it just goes on and I, I'm telling you, how can you believe this guy's 26 It blow you away? Right. So the next thing that you're involved in is you're involved in a sourcing group, yes. right? Um, it's you and Brittany and Darla and um, Arie. Um, right. And, you know, you have a group and you are out there. um identifying products for people, well, using VAs, but identifying products, but you're vetting the products. And that's what really impressed me. And what impressed me more was the way it's very specific category-wise. So talk a little bit about it. And, and I know Darla had already given quite a bit about it, but just, just a little bit brief and in, in your involvement of it. Yeah, so the the service is YourSourcedInventory.com. We focus exclusively for sellers that are looking for products in the clothing and shoe categories. We send a list with a minimum of 10 products per day that have an absolute minimum of 40% ROI, and the ranks are under 50,000 in their respective categories. Generally, the ROIs are quite a bit better, um, but we sort through and filter filter out any duds to make sure that the products that you're receiving are, are really viable inventory opportunities so that you can quickly filter through and purchase inventory for your Amazon business and uh We limit it to 50 people on the list to limit competition. And since it's in the clothing and shoe categories, that further limits your competition on Amazon. So we've had had quite a few people be really happy with this service so far, and it's really been able to allow them to purchase a lot more in less time. Yeah, I, I think it's so smart because if you want to expand in a gated category, A, that's where you really want to be, right? You want to be in a gated category. And to be able to get such a focus list that meets the requirements for your business, that is time you don't have to spend. So I understand it's, I think, 149 a month, but you don't have to take that time. And I just think there's a lot of value in it. So I was really impressed with that. Yeah. Online Selling Experiment Facebook group. 
again, 2,000 members. And so that is kind of a catch-all for people um, to interact, or what, what's the goal of that? Yeah, so that, that is mainly for to interact um, and to share day-to-day things that aren't fit for an entire blog post. Um, as I've grown the business a little bit more, I haven't been doing blog posts quite as often on Online Selling Experiment but I do generally post a couple times a week in the online selling experiment Facebook group um, with, with one-off things here and there to whether it's a helpful tip, something interesting. Um, and then it's also, there's quite a few other people that post in there fairly regularly with, with things they're trying or just questions they have. Ultimately it's a kind of a catch all for things that I'm posting as well as questions others have. Um, you'll see sales screenshots, shipment pictures, and there's also, useful information in there pretty often as well. And so you still allowing members? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, it's a free group. Okay. And I'll, I'll have links to all this stuff. All right. So what's next? Um, you know, you, (laughs) it's not like you don't have enough to do, but what do you, what do you see? Where do you see yourself going next? Yeah. So ultimately my next move, I am starting a small coaching program. Um, but related to selling on Amazon, but that's um, just a small piece of it. Ultimately, my next goal, though, is to float cash flow, the, take the cash flow from Amazon and invest into real estate. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning, I do owner occupy a duplex currently, um, but longer term, I would like to purchase quite a few more multifamily rental properties and get to the point where that builds up uh, a monthly income level that I would be able to live off to live off of as well. And then I would be completely self-sustainable regardless of if Amazon carries on. Um, obviously, I do hope that it carries on and the opportunity stays as it does for the long ter- long term. Um, but I want the real estate to be in place as well so that I have, have another leg to stand on should I need to. Yeah. A B plan, a C plan, right? And and uh, I love it. I just think that's so smart. Um, okay. So we're at the... Uh, just about to the end. I I did want to get this from you because I I think you're going to offer something here. Any podcasts or books that you're listening to that we could recommend to our listeners? Yeah, I I read quite a few business books. Um, A few that I really like are The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, uh, The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz, The Millionaire Fast Lane um, by MJ DeMarco. Um, Let's see, The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. Those are probably four of my four of my real favorites. Um, and those are I think all of those are are valuable as far as podcasts. Um, besides yours, of course, uh, I also <laughs> listen to um, Smart Passive Income. That's the one I've Love been listening it. to the most for um, for the longest period of time. Um, I always go back to that. Um, but other than that, I don't listen to too many podcasts. Uh, pretty easy to get information overload with all of the all of the stuff out there i try to stay focused and and still manage to get things done oh i agree and and smart passive income is my favorite who led me to john lee dumas who Mm -hmm. uh, got me up and running with my podcast and i just uh uh, it is tough with information overload um i'd read uh three of the books i have not read slight edge from jeff olson so i'm gonna go take it check that one out for myself. Okay, so the last part of the podcast that I ask you to do is, you know, the goal of the podcast is to help people get past stuck, right? They're mm-hmm. selling ten or $20,000 a month. They can't make a full-time living with that, right? And they're trying to figure out how to get to that next level. They're trying to move past stuck, I guess, right? So mm-hmm. uh, looking for a process improvement, um, tip, trick, something that we could do tomorrow, regardless of the size of their business, where they can move forward. Yeah, the biggest thing that I would recommend for people is to outsource something that is a non-revenue generating task or something that they can outsource for less than the cost. The easiest one to probably get rid of is to hire someone to ship your products. Um, that was one of the the first steps that I took um, in association with hiring outsourcers. But that has freed probably 20 hours a week from my plate that I'm able to then turn around and go find inventory or work on long-term strategy for the business. So I would say outsource something, Um, free up your time and move it towards a long-term business, whether that's hiring a shipper, hiring someone to source for you, Um, just get somebody else involved. Um, That's been the the number one thing that's, that's grown my business. And that's what I would encourage people to do as soon as they possibly can. 
Great advice. Man, I'm I'm just so thrilled to talk with you. I can't wait to see you. I'll see you next month. And I, I just can't wait to, to see you again. And, and I'm just so impressed. Uh, the consistency, the honesty, the clarity, the help. You're always willing to help anybody. I see you answering a ton of questions out there on Facebook. And, you know, it's just it's just such a great guy. And, and we're really, really lucky to have you on here tonight. I appreciate you taking the time. We can get in touch with you on Online Selling Experiment, on Facebook, on your sourced inventory. I'll have links to all those for Ryan. Okay. Hey, Ryan, thanks again, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Thanks for listening to the e-commerce momentum podcast. All the links mentioned today can be found at ecommercemomentum.com under this episode number. Please remember to subscribe and like us on iTunes.